I wanted to contribute to the circular economy and this is what I do now at Cori. Because as I said before, what we do is we develop new materials that are bio-based and biodegradable and elastic and that are also based on um, food-based streams. So at the moment we're working with uh, banana peels and nutshells and um, we produce a, yeah, a biopolymer, biopolymer composite um, that we can then apply, for example, as shoe soles, which is our first use case at the moment. Hello and welcome everybody to a new episode of Your Friendly Physicist and Other Nerds, your science podcast where scientists speak about their fantastic research, their visions, dreams, challenges and their daily life in the fabulous world of science. My name is Lucas, I'm your friendly physicist and today I'm in the beautiful city of Zürich meeting my friend and former colleague Christian who currently is working for the clean tech startup Kuori where he analyzes and investigates how waste products like banana and nutshells can be turned into biodegradable and elastic alternatives for plastics. It's an honor for me. Welcome to the show, Christian. Hello. Hi. Let me shortly introduce you properly. Um, so I already mentioned we were former colleagues. We did our bachelor and master studies together at the University of Bayreuth long, long time ago. Uh, we studied chemistry and polymer science and after master studies Christian left for ETH Zürich where he got his doctoral degree at the chair of wood material sciences um, and after that he stayed a bit longer in this group as a postdoc and since April uh, He started a new position as head of research and development at the startup Quori. And yeah, this is also uh, the topic we are talking today. Um, what is it like to work uh, in a startup? What's the difference to academia? Uh, what is your product about? Um, how, how can we benefit from sustainable plastics? Uh, what is the process like? But first, uh, the question everyone on this podcast has to answer. Um, since it's called Your Friendly Physicist and Other Nerds, uh, Christian, would you consider yourself uh, as a nerd? Uh, yes, I would consider myself as a nerd. Um, but I really think this is a positive thing. Absolutely. Uh, I, anti I identify myself as a nerd because I'm curious, I'm interested in science, natural science, but also social sciences and uh, looking for new knowledge and this for me is quite nerdy but uh, in a positive way I think. Yeah, absolutely. This is, uh, this is the second goal of this podcast to unframe nerd as a negative negative uh, term. So that's good. So uh, Christian is a nerd so he's uh, in any case uh, on, in, the right, in the right spot on, the, on, this, on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so Christian, you left ETH Zürich um, roughly six months ago. And um, you went to, yeah, indus can we call it industry, startup? Um, why, why was that? What, what were the reasons you left academia and, and started this new position? Well, first I, I left already one and a half years ago, so last year's uh, June. Ah, okay. I finished after five years in, in academia at ETH. Um, yeah, I really liked uh, doing academic research. Um, I liked my projects and I really enjoyed working in the lab, uh, having projects together with colleagues and um, conceiving new interesting stuff. But in the end, uh, why I left, I think, is more or less the uh, academic system where I didn't see any perspective for myself. So, um, to be more specific, I think If I had decided that I would have stayed in academia, I would have had to change my location to, to go away from Zurich or to go to another country. Uh, but at the same time, I have a family, so two children, and we are very well integrated here in Zurich and really like it here, so I didn't want to go somewhere else. And also, partly because of my family life, I was not so much invested during my PhD. And with this, I mean like working six days a week and stuff like this. So. Um, I guess I was not as productive as other people were in their PhD and then I think you have it quite hard to to in the end make it to a permanent position in academia. 
And then I decided that I cannot and don't want to invest five to ten more years with this uncertainty whether or not to find a position in the yeah. end. Yeah. Especially in the years between yeah, 30 and 40 where you decide so much in your life, where you live, if you have a family, yes. what's, what's your future like? It just didn't fit into my personal plans also. I said, yeah. As I said, yeah. we wanted to stay here in Zurich and, and there I didn't see any perspective. Uh, yeah, Of course, maybe I could have tried to stay at ETH a little bit longer, but in the end, yeah, as I said, you have to go to another country because you can only be a good scientist if you work at least at two or three universities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently this is true, according to general opinion, yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, I totally get it. Um, so, and then you found this this position at Kori. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more. What's what's the business model or what's the vision of this startup? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I wanted to do after I left academia was to work for a company in the bio-based material area, like something that is uh, connected to my background, but also has a connection to a more sustainable future and uh, I wanted to contribute to the circular economy and this is what I do now at Cori because as I said before what we do is we develop new materials that are bio-based and biodegradable and elastic and that are also based on um, food-based streams so at the moment we're working with uh, banana peels and nutshells and um, we produce a yeah a biopolymer biopolymer composite um, that we can then apply, for example, as shoe soles, which is our first use case at the moment. Okay. <laughs> and your question maybe also was why a startup company? Um, yeah, I think it just was a good fit between me and Corey. Um, I was contacted by our founder and she asked me whether I, were, whether I could imagine working for Corey, and I could, <laughs> of course. Um, and also here in Switzerland and especially close to Zurich, there are not so many companies working in this field of bio-based materials. Um, so I really liked uh, to get the offer from Quarry and uh, yeah, I took it. <laughs> yeah, there was, <clears throat> when I did a, a bit of a research about Quarry and, and um, the vision they have, it was quite surprising that there are so little companies in, in Switzerland or, or in general that are dealing um, yeah, with circular economy, developing sustainable materials that can be alternatives for plastics. So that was, I mean, I mean, it's also maybe an advantage because you don't have so many competitors for for the use case you have, or mm -hmm. how how does how how does this work out for you or yeah, for your company? I would say in, in the European Union there are quite some companies and um, also other. Yeah, research institutions, for example, that are working on more sustainable materials and uh, also there are country-specific differences. I think uh, in the Netherlands they have a very big um, approach towards circular economy. But here in Switzerland we are a little, little bit behind, I would say, um, in this bio-based economy. But yeah, as you said, this could be a chance for Cori. And especially because we are really trying to produce elastic materials, which is not so easy to make them bio-based and biodegradable. Um, often you have these materials, but they are then brittle or really hard. And of course you cannot make shoe soles is, out of these is, materials. Is there then a network of, of or a network of knowledge about such processes to form elastic and stable, mechanical stable um, materials do you approach other companies or other or, or universities uh, where you have like researchers spending some of their time to to develop such materials yeah we are at the moment work together with the university of applied science of northwestern switzerland um, at the institute for polymer technology and they are helping us a lot because they have very much experience with um, the plastics industry they did a lot of research and projects together with other companies concerning also sustainable plastic materials and we really profit from their knowledge and also from their infrastructure which is very valuable for us um, and apart from this we are of course um, we are building up a network of um, eco-conscious companies and eco-conscious people or people who have the same motivation as we have and there are some um, some 
events and networks that, that provide knowledge, but not so specific for for plastics, but in general circular economy and, and uh, bio-based economy. So that means most of the knowledge uh, that you have turning food waste into useful alternatives for plastics was developed by by Kori, by the company itself. So so how does a typical day for you look like? You you really stand in the lab on the battlefield of science and try to, to plasticize uh, food waste? Or how does that look like? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, Kori is still quite a small company. So, um, yeah, we are all doing a little bit uh, everything, I would say. <laughs> Um, and for me, this means that I'm not so much in the laboratory anymore, or for us, laboratory means uh, polymer processing equipment like uh, injection molding machines or extrusion. Um, so not, not really chemistry laboratory anymore. Um, but yeah, I have a very good uh, employee who uh, did, a, did a student project with us and now he stayed and he's doing most of the, of the lab work. And also we have somebody from the university who's also working uh, on our project and they are really experts when it comes to to what button to press at the machine. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm mm -hmm. more working on strategy and coordination of all the um, research projects, but also um, yeah, outreach to partners, to potential customers, explaining our approach and explaining our material. Um, like if you would ask what is the typical day, I cannot really give an answer because every day is different. Of course. <laughs> this would be probably just like in your PhD life. It <laughs> yes. was more or less the same. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite similar. Um, a lot apart of, from the fact that you don't go to the lab so much yeah, anymore. But a um, lot of different tasks. And yeah, there are a lot of different tasks. So I also do a lot of home office, which is then sitting on the computer, writing emails, reading literature, reaching out to partners, as I said. But also I wrote an... A research grant application which was uh, quite intense and took a lot of time and then was this of course was only uh, laptop work okay but still a, a lot of communication involved I would say so networking meeting people explaining or pitching your idea yes because as I said we are not so many people yeah, and I am yeah. the guy that knows the technology and that can explain the, the material best so whenever these questions come up I have to be there and answer the questions so, but your knowledge that you build up during your PhD, I mean, you worked a lot um, with wood-based materials. So wood is also uh, like a polymer, like a bioplastic, so to say. That definitely helped you now, or helps you now for doing this particular job and explaining all the, yeah, the research behind and the science behind, behind this, this business case, right? Yeah, that's true. I mean, I was in my PhD, I was working on uh, wood biopolymer composites. So I also combined wood with uh, proteins back then, um, mostly proteins. And so I was always interested in all the biological and bio-based polymers. Um, of course, as you said before, we come from the polymer science uh, education background. Mm -hmm. um, so this was what I, what, I, what I knew best and what I was also educated in. Um, whereas wood was a very new topic for me. But I never lost track of all the bioplastic development and I was always interested in this and um, it also was useful for my PhD and so this helps me now a lot. And I would say now I, I can combine this, uh, this knowledge that I, that I gained during my PhD uh, with the theoretic knowledge that I got from, from mm -hmm. our studies. But as I told you before, before we started uh, recording, um, I, during my PhD I didn't do any polymer chemistry or so for five years. And then, of course, you know all the theories from your studies, yeah, but this yeah. is a completely different thing when you are when you're working on an injection molding machine or so. It's also a different um, scale, I think. It's different scale, yeah. yeah and and uh, I learn a lot at the moment, like every day is also learning. And uh, yeah, you, you cannot be afraid of asking questions. So. Yeah, but uh, li like to, uh, if you like to learn, I mean, this is also something that makes you a nerd, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Always be yeah, it's stable. a perfect nerd job, maybe. <laughs> Except from the people. You have to meet a lot of people, so maybe this is not so nerdy. If <laughs> yeah, I mean, there can also be extrovertic uh, nerds. That's um, true, yeah. Nice, yeah, so, sounds super interesting, sounds super interesting. So I, I don't know if I can ask this question, now, but how, how do you do it? How do you turn food in, food waste into plastics? Or is this like like the, the secret processes that you're not allowed to talk 
this is of course our secret, but maybe I can disclose a little bit to you. I mean, we uh, collect the banana peels or nutshells, and also we are trying out uh, different waste streams. Um, and then we grind them, basically, and then we introduce them to our production process, which is then a, um, yeah, a mixing with other ingredients that are, of course, uh, <laughs> secret. Secret, but still bio-based. And yeah, this is our and this is the point. Like our our vision is to create a one hundred percent bio based and biodegradable material. And uh, we have now material that is biodegradable, but we are not at one hundred percent bio based content. Mm -hmm. And this is what we are working on. And so there's still work to do for me, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is the difficult thing to have everything also bio based. Um, and at the moment we are not there, but uh, we are running towards the finish line. I would say. That's that's cool. So this you would describe as the biggest challenge. To, to, so the road towards one hundred percent. Yeah, we have uh, we have multiple challenges, but the big challenge is to to get the hundred percent bio based content. Okay, nice. So and then I, I mean your product. Um, I mean I saw it on the internet, and I also have one of these shoes um, here on the table. Um, so it's mechanical stable. Mm -hmm. It's elastic. And it's biodegradable. That's yeah. the three key features then of your. Of I your mean, what we have, of course, we have to match the performance, mechanical performance, uh, compared to uh, to what the shoe companies use now. Um, and then we want to have our our material biodegradable, which in our case means it is compostable. So this means after the shoe is worn and that you cannot wear it anymore, then you can. Uh, potentially put it into a um, industrial composting unit where it's then composed, composted to to biogas, uh, mm -hmm. for example, for energy production. Um, so while you're walking, the shoe is mechanically stable, but afterwards you can degrade it. But another issue is, and this is also one of the main motivations for us why we do this, is that you rub off microplastics when you walk from mm -hmm. your shoe soles. And every person um, rubs off approximately 100 grams of shoe sole material every year, which adds up to quite a big number for all the people living in Switzerland and in Europe and you know, the whole world. Yeah, I think it was like only for Switzerland was like 600 tons yeah. an annually. This is, yeah, I've, I've, I mean, you can calculate it. It's 8 million people times uh, 0 0.1. So it's about, yeah. 800 tons or so, 800 tons. if I'm not mistaken. That's, that was the number that really <laughs> Yeah, it's num me. It's in, if, you have, if you get the list for microplastic sources, then it's number seven. Of course, number one is um, car tires. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are asking us, why, you're not, why don't you do car tires with your materials? But I would say this is the uh, Champions League of elastomers and <laughs> very hard to, 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 uh, yeah. to reach. But yeah, as I said, if, when you walk around, you rub off your shoe soles. And I mean, you can also see if you have a shoe that is two years old or so, the sole yeah. is gone <laughs> and it has to be somewhere. And it goes directly into our environment. And the rubber stuff that the shoe soles are made of, it does not degrade. Um, so it accumulates in the ecosystems and it's still under investigation and unclear uh, what it really causes in the ecosystems. But we know for sure that at least um, the microscopic life is mm -hmm. uh, impacted with this material. So we did tests with our material um, and the small particles that are rubbed off from the shoe sole, they degrade in a rather short time. Um, so the shoe sole on the shoe is stable, but the, the smaller particles um, degrade in a shorter period of time. I would but, say what does short, short time period mean? In, so we did experiments for one month, one month and they lost quite a bit of their mass in this time. So I would say in a few months it's gone. Okay. Which, of course, you could argue is still too long, but yeah, it's the best you get uh, for the moment. I mean, it's a huge improvement uh, compared to uh, this microplastic, yeah. which basically has entered any <laughs> food chain you can imagine. And any, it's everywhere, yeah. And, and any parts of the world and, and whatever. So um, that's, that's quite awesome. Uh, why shoe soles? So this is, this is the first product you, you yes. developed, right? Or, and the only one right now, or are there other products as so at well? The, at the moment, we are also looking in other markets so where we can where we could enter. Because in the end, what we produce is not the shoe sole; we produce the granules, the plastic granules that then the producer, the shoe producers, mm -hmm. or also producers of other products uh, can use in their in their machinery and their um, production process for producing the final product. Product, which 
in the beginning is a shoe sole in our first use case. And this is because in, uh, for shoe sole our material makes a lot of sense because as I said, it's about microplastic yeah, that is rubbed yeah. off into the environment. And yeah. this, is, this is a problem for shoes. Um, and of course, um, we can also think about uh, other use cases for our material that where you need elastomer materials and this quite frankly is everywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, not everywhere the plastic is rubbed off and not everywhere it directly gets into the environment. So shoe soles make a lot of sense for us. Mm -hmm. but, yes, but as I said, we are also evaluating other markets and working together with uh, partners from other markets already um, where we can then, where we hope to, to be able to sell our material to. And when you say, so you see yourself rather as a provider of the material who is delivering the material to, to big companies, big shoe companies, and then the material is compatible with their processing routines, with their machines, with the regular temperatures they are processed and, and just like usual regular uh, thermo el elastomers. Yes, we are producing a thermoplastic elastomer yeah. that you can um, yeah, introduce in, in all of the, the production technologies that already use thermoplastic elastomers, um, which are at the moment mostly polyurethanes. Um, but our material is uh, compatible with, with these technologies and we provide the data sheet and then all the temperatures are, are in a range that are normally used. Okay. And then you can, so can you already like tune your, your material composition, for example, for shoes for, for runners or shoes for hikers or shoes for just, I want to have a nice sneaker? Or is it, is it just one, one material for, for all needs? No, this is what we try and this is also our, one of our advantages as a startup, I would say, that we are quite um, flexible and um, we can what we do is we work together with the customers or partners and they tell us what they need. And of course, there is not one shoe sole, but one company needs a harder shoe sole than the other company. The third company might wish to have a foamed shoe sole. And we are trying to, to match these, uh, these properties that they, that they need. And this is also good for us because um, with the content and the um, constitution of our waste streams, we can also tune the, the material properties. So if a customer says they want a different property, we know that we know what to do with our, with our ingredients, how we have to mix them, that we get another property. And this is basically what we do. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sounds, sounds quite, quite nice. Yeah. So I just saw that you successfully achieved your, your funding campaign. Um, so, so what's the plan for Quarry now? So what's, what's, what's ahead? Yeah, we just uh, finished our crowdfunding campaign and we, this was successful and also I think because of you partly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for your contribution. <laughs> Here I come. <laughs> um, and this is particularly good because we were part of the so-called impact fund of this uh, platform. It's called Remake It. Uh, this means that we raised now 25,000 uh, Swiss francs from our um, donators. And we get another 25,000 from the platform on top. So we got okay. 50,000 from them. At the same time, we also now got our first investments from business angels. And so for the moment, we are quite well founded, um, which is, of course, relaxing and gives a good feeling. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> so now it's really about uh, getting into the market, scaling up production. And we want to start selling in the beginning of next year and make our first revenues next year. So this is uh, quite a stretch, but mm -hmm. I'm positive mm -hmm. we can make it. Um, how, how, I mean, how long? Is Quarry already around or when was it founded? So um, our founder, Sarah, she developed the project during her studies. And this was, I think, uh, one year ago she started. One about, year ago? About one year ago. And the company was founded in the beginning of this year. And uh, now here we are. Like, uh, oh, wow. Okay. About one year later. So just one year and you already have like, uh, I mean, I see the shoe sole in front of me and there's already product yes. yes we have a product as i said we are not uh, at the finish line but uh, we have a product and uh, okay we are that's quite impressive we're proud <laughs> we yeah are, you can be proud we of hope yourself, you yeah. can also sell it uh, because of of course yeah you have now here a prototype but uh, it's a different thing to sell a, a significant amount of the material mm -hmm. yeah wow well, that's that's i thought it was i thought quarry was was older than than one year that's quite impressive I mean, how, how is it in general to work 
for a startup. I mean, maybe some of the listeners also are thinking leaving academia or trying to figure out what's what's best, good, joining a, a a big company, big corporate, or a small startup. Where I think, I mean, you started in April. You're now head of research and development. So it's I think it's quite an uh, quite big responsibility. Quite big. Um, yeah, we can. I, th- I think decide a lot in this company. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's also quite a small company. So what is it like? I mean, can you can you based on your experiences? Can you recommend it so far? Well, of course, I can only speak for my personal situation yeah, yeah. that I sure. experienced at Kobe. Um, but yeah, it's um, you have to be aware of certain things. I mean, if you enter a startup and especially in the early stage, as for Kobe it is now, um, you don't have like fixed structures. Um, you don't have um, the same, I would say, pff, yeah, luxury as in a bigger company mm-hmm. where they, where everything is set. If you enter, uh, I mean, I never worked for a big company, but this is how yeah. I imagine it. <laughs> you yeah. enter your your office on the first day, and then you get your laptop, you get everything, you get your desk, and then you have somebody who who introduces to do everything. And uh, right. for a small startup, this is not the case. You have to find your own way mm-hmm. and. On the other hand, it's uh, so much fun because you're working together with the whole team most of the time. Uh, I know everybody and I know what everybody is doing. And uh, from my position, I also get to get a big influence on the company. I mean, I, uh, we decide everything together, we are discussing everything, we are working on a strategy together. And this is maybe also the main difference from, from academia. Um, as a PhD student or as a postdoc, I was not so much... Uh, there was not just so much strategic thinking, also especially not when it comes to business or economic uh, mm. economic thinking, and this is what we now have to do all the time. And it's for me, it's fun because uh, um, I don't want to focus one hundred percent on the on the chemistry or scientific part, but I'm also interested in these other things, business development and uh, strategy. So this is great, and uh, you also get to know a lot of, lot of interesting people because. Um, yeah, if you have an interesting startup, you people are interesting mm. interested in you, and then yeah. there are not so many people to talk with from the startup. So yeah. uh, I am not a guy that's responsible for the technology stuff. And whenever there's a question from somebody, yeah, I talk to them, and these are very interesting people yeah. and very. Yeah, yeah, for sure, you're entering a different bubble. So from your academic bubble to to the startup tech bubble, can be quite interesting. Yeah, I can imagine. But I mean, because you mentioned. Um, in the beginning that you left academia because of so much uncertainty was there. Uh, I, I mean, I imagine a startup, yeah, the crowdfunding campaign now went successfully. I mean, what would have been the case if it would have failed? Was there a point where the team or the founder, the CEO or you said, okay, this might fail <laughs> in the end? Yeah, of course, we knew that we had to find money until the end of the year. Otherwise, it probably would just have stopped, <laughs> I would say. Um, and this is a kind of uncertainty that you have and uh, to be honest this was also something I just think about a lot and mm. also discuss with my family whether this is feasible for us and we can do it um, but in the end we decided that now this is a good thing and I mean we have now funding for one or two years and if it ends after this I had one or two great years and, and gained a lot of experience and a big network um, so I would say that if it's not successful um, which is the uncertainty that you always face in the startup uh, area. If it's not successful, then uh, I still have good chances to find a good next position. Mm. But for academia, if you spend uh, two or three or five years as a postdoc um, and then you will want to change like a, uh, to industry, can also go well, but I also yeah. know people who uh, for, for whom it was really tough. Yeah. yeah, it's a different kind of uncertainty, that's for sure, yeah. It always depends if you want to stay in the field, because I think the, I mean the startup might fail, but the idea itself is, it's the idea is great and the idea for sure will will live on, might maybe in a different form, uh, or in a different company, but um, for sure it 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 will will go on and you have the knowledge about this and about the processes and about how to uh, work in a startup. So, yeah, I, I, I get it. Yeah, I mean, if the, if, if the startup fails, then uh, you get to work in another company or another mm-hmm. startup even. Uh, and academia, when, when you cannot get a permanent position in the end, you cannot go to the next academic position, but then it's just over. You have to leave then. And 
um, leaving, leaving, leaving academia for me was not so easy because, as I said, I liked it a lot. But I can imagine that if you spend another five to ten years in academia, leaving mm. then is even harder. Yeah, yeah. But and um, on the other hand, I think your job is not so much different than a job in academia, uh, just based on the tasks you're doing. I mean, of course, you're doing less research, or you're you're standing less in the lab, or doing actual research and the actual scientific tasks. But I think also if you would have stayed in academia for the postdocs and if you, you are more experienced, you start to do less in the lab and are more involved in strategic tasks and have maybe own students who are doing then the, the, the lab tasks, I would say. So I think it, you found a quite nice balance between working in a startup but still doing science and having a quite significant impact, uh, I would say, Uh, yeah, on, on the society by really developing a product that can be used, I think. That, so that's always, for me, like, um, yeah, the biggest issue, uh, still working in academia. I mean, of course, you're doing fundamental research and it might, in 20 or 30 years, someone is, uh, someone needs that knowledge to, to make a real impact or, or the research goes to industry and you develop a nice product that is sustainable and and contributes to our society but you don't see it when you do the actual measurements the actual science and this is always like hmm, okay what am i actually doing here is this really this is it or what so so it's nice to to have a task where you really see an output where you can yeah. grab a product yeah and not just one tiny sample of a few milligrams and you can say well this is the polymer of the future yeah. might be that this is the polymer of the future Yeah, I mean, this is really also a point. I, I know back when we did our master thesis together in the lab, um, this was really fundamental research where you couldn't see any yeah. application. Um, and then in the root materials groups was a little bit different because there were also people who had great projects uh, with, with, with a tangible turnout. So one guy was building a, like a tower somewhere, <laughs> which was really great, mm -hmm. made from wood. Um, but for myself, I, I still continued doing uh, fundamental research and there was, as you said, no product that came out from this. And now it's completely different. So I... We produce our material, then I send it to our partner and they produce a shoe from this. And then suddenly, uh, two weeks later, you have a shoe on your desk that yeah. is made with your material. This yeah, is that's, fantastic. That's great. That's really great. So you think this is the future of, of plastics? Is this the... So Cori is the first, and probably not the first, but Cori is a part of the first startups, the first companies that are producing plastics on, on a larger scale from, from food waste or from any waste? Um, this is a huge question. I mean, um, there have been there have been um, there has been work on on bio based uh, plastics and biodegradable plastics for quite a time, and they um, couldn't really um, yeah they couldn't really challenge the mass polymers like uh, polypropylene polyethylene. Um, so I guess the future of plastics. Um, How could this, how could this be? I mean, there are. I would say there are two there are two directions. Like um, one direction, this is uh, recycling, so that you take the polymers that we already have, and this could be polyethylene or PET or whatever. So and everything fossil based. Fossil based, but also yeah. bio based. Yeah. So this doesn't really make a difference. I mean, you can also produce uh, um, PETs from from bio based sources. But the thing is that you then afterwards you do recycling, so you use the material again, and be it uh, mechanically, so you, you, you melt it up again and then use it again, which has certain difficulties with, with it. But you can also use it mechanically again, you can, um, mm. you can degrade it uh, to its molecular building blocks and then polymerize it again, and you can use it again. So this is one direction. And then there's the other, that other, direc the other direction that we are going, which is... Um, so there is the other direction that we are going, um, which is... Um, biodegradable polymers and this means that um, when you think of a circular economy that we of course have to have to go to and um, then we reintegrate our material into the biological cycle so our material is biodegraded and then it's again in the, in the natural environment doesn't do any harm and uh, is just degraded whereas the recycled polymer mechanically recycled for example this is in a technological cycle and uh, is then reused which is mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is also okay, I think, but there are there are certain applications where you need uh, recycling and others where you can use biodegradation and 
Um, I think we need both. We do not have to decide. Yeah, but yeah. what is for sure that in the future we need plastics. Um, I think we can reduce them, but uh, we also still need them. They are a fantastic material. Um, but we are just seeing now that we went too far, and we now have to have to um, yeah solve this problem somehow. Yeah, for sure, there is not the solution to to how to establish a circular economy. Um, but there are many, and I think, yeah, as you said, um, all of these ways have, have their advantages and their disadvantages. But one question, <laughs> I mean, your, your shoe sole is biodegradable, so that means you can use it just for a certain amount of time and then it's just degraded, or uh, how, how durable is, is your material? That's what I described before, the shoe sole on the shoe is mechanically stable it's, and it okay. doesn't really degrade uh, over time. Just when you put it into industrial com compostation, okay. it just means it's higher temperature. So you're um, accelerating the... And then you're accelerating the process. Okay. But on your shoe, it will not degrade uh, to, a, to a recognizable amount. Yeah. So you can use it for several years. Yeah, I mean, this is also an issue that for that you, you say you can use it for several years, but the reality is that shoes are... Yeah. Uh, the life cycle of a shoe, when we talk to shoe companies, they often tell us it's one year or two years. Um, and uh, maybe this is also something that uh, a lot of people are not aware, but uh, shoes are also part of this fast fashion development that you um, own more and more shoes, you wear them not so often anymore and then give them away or trash them or whatever. Um, and this is a huge problem. Yeah, this is uh, what I am always telling my mom when she said, hey kid, you need new shoes, <laughs> look at those. And said, no, no I'm, I'm part of the solution, not of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great approach, yeah. Um, but when you, when you approach like these big shoe companies, um, is, are there or, already any, any, like, like, is there any marketing, um, testing stuff? Are people using using or might use them? I mean, probably you can form the shoe sole in any form you want, yes. uh, since it's you can probably also color it with any uh, color you want. So basically, it doesn't make a difference, right? For for the shoe itself, it might just look like a regular shoe with synthetic fossil based yeah. elastomers. Could be the case, yeah. Of course, we would be interested that that uh, the people know that it's core material on the shoe. Yeah. Uh, but at the moment we are working together with one uh, shoe company from Germany who uh, uh, already produced shoes with the sole as prototypes and uh, then mm -hmm. we could test them in the real world environment. Um, and this is Wildling shoes, uh, I, can, I think I can say this because it's public. <laughs> yeah. And um, they are working together with us and they, as I said, they have the same mindset that, uh, as we have and they have the same goals. They want to go to a circular shoe and uh, an yeah. environmentally, uh, environmentally friendly shoe. And this is why they support us so much and really profit from them because they have established shoe brand that give us so much knowledge about the whole market and how all this works. Um, but of course, we're also looking for other customers, other shoe brands to work together with. And um, let's say like this, it's easier to work together with the shoe brands that are already interested in sustainable solutions mm -hmm. than with the other ones. And I, I think I can imagine that I mean the price might be even lower since you're I mean of course depends on on the upscalability of of your material but since it's coming from waste. Yeah, price is of course always an issue, and it's also one big difference to academia because yeah. in academia you write a paper and you have a fancy new material that is great performing and everything. Because uh, but it's uh, <laughs> one thousand million dollars. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, extremely expensive. You cannot even scale it up uh, at all. Um, but for us, we always have to consider pricing and... Um, prices might decrease when you scale it up. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is always this bus phrase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, this is... It's a difficult topic because, on the one hand, as you said, uh, the waste uh, can make it cheaper, but we cannot expect that in the future that the waste still stays uh, cheap because waste will be a resource and then we have to pay for this resource, like for everything else. Um, and yeah, we have to we have to be price competitive, and this is a big issue also for us. Yeah, yeah. Especially when you're not producing in so big amounts, or when you don't have a commodity polymer that is uh, easy to synthesize, then it's hard to be in a, the same price region. Mm -hmm. And this is also why you need partners who are willing to pay a little bit more, maybe in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but have then a more sustainable product. Yeah. 
No, and I think, I mean, people are willing to pay more. I think uh, certain people are willing to pay more um, just to, uh, and, and have a ecological friendly, biodegradable, partly shoe then in the end. We hope so. Yeah, great. <laughs> cool, Christian. Many thanks for joining on this podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a great experience. Yeah, anything you, you haven't said so far, anything you, you want to add? No, I'm just happy to talk to you and to yeah. see you again after so many years, Lucas. So many years, yeah. <laughs> no, like, it's really great that you approached me for this project and to see you again today. And, yeah. Yeah. It was fun. Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, it was, was really fun. It's a great project, great company. Thanks. Many thanks. Thanks to our listeners, if we have any. <laughs> and see you uh, on the next episode of Your Friendly Physicist and Other Nerds. Well, that's it for today. If you have any questions to Christian or to me, feel free to reach out, either on Twitter or LinkedIn. The best thing about this podcast really is that it's about you and everyone can participate. So if you want to share an exciting story about your science, your academic life, some crazy experiments or any other nerdy stuff, feel free to drop a short message. Thanks for tuning in. Take care and see you soon on the next episode of Your Friendly Physicist and Other Nerds. Bye.